Hello everyone, welcome to Raise Your Stakes, aka Narrative Frameworks are Grouse. And I'm going to be spending this entire talk telling you why narrative frameworks are amazing and how they can help you maximize your emotional impact with players and also what other roles they can fill within your team. So, who am I? Very good question. I am Gabriella Logren. I currently work at Infinity Plus Two as a narrative designer and associate content producer slash designer on Puzzle Quest 3. Puzzle Quest 3 is the sequel to Puzzle Quest 1 and 2, clearly, and is a reboot of our franchise. Now, it was very important for us when making Puzzle Quest 3 to ensure that our narrative was very strong, as we wanted it to be one of the main pillars of the game. And the needs of players have changed drastically since the original titles did release. And one thing that players are demanding more and more frequently is strongest stories and we really wanted to make sure that we included that when we set about making puzzle quest 3. now if you would like to follow me you can find me on twitter under at ella logren it would validate me very much if you wanted to follow me no pressure but please feel free to follow me if you would like to you are also always welcome to contact me via twitter and at the end of this talk i also put up my email address so you can ask me any questions that you might have or if you would like any information that I have included in these slides shared with you, I'm more than happy to share that with you and as I mentioned, answer questions. So, what are narrative frameworks? Probably seems quite self-evident, but I think before we start talking about how to use them and why we want to use them, we should probably actually talk about what they are. So what are they? Frameworks for your narrative. Yes, thank you, Captain Obvious Ella. But they are frameworks for your narrative. And what are frameworks but documentation? Frameworks are documentation that include world building, notes on narrative structure, which we are going to get into, plot beats, both narrative and emotional, character development, player agency, and limitations. So why is documentation important? Look. I could do an entire talk on why documentation is so important. It is something that is a key element of creating a cohesive game. It's useful for studios, it's useful for stakeholders, it's useful for publishers, and it's useful for the individual. However, we're just going to keep it simple for now. As I said, there's a whole talk in there and documentation is really good for helping people align on vision, measure deliverables, and work towards a common goal, which I mean, is aligning on vision. But we will get more into that in a little bit. I think one thing that we should cover very quickly is narrative structure, as your narrative structure will greatly inform the way that you do your narrative framework. So, what is narrative structure? It is a literary element generally described as the structural framework that underlies the order and manner in which a narrative is presented to a reader, listener, or viewer. The narrative text structures are the plot and the setting, which is from Wikipedia. And you know what? For a Wikipedia definition, it's very good. So I did think it would be remiss of me to not touch on the role of narrative structure, especially as it does play a key role in the planning of your narrative and informs how you build your narrative frameworks. Now, there's a couple different narrative structures. We're not going to go into in-depth information on each of these structures. But I have included a link here that goes into more depth on the largely understood seven different kinds of traditional narrative structure. Now, as human beings, we definitely tend towards certain structures more than others. And there's a reason why there are only a few that are generally popularized today. It's because as humans, we find them satisfying. We find that they inspire us or make us feel something and there's a reason why we've had them to the beginning of all human storytelling it's because they fulfill a need within us so there's a few different ways to tell stories here is a really good link if you want to read more about different kinds of narrative structure you can use any narrative structure for a video game but make sure you decide on it before you start writing as your story structure will help you define key points of your narrative and give you a clear path to a more satisfying and relatable story. It also helps you identify key beats which you're going to want to flesh out in your narrative frameworks. The two that are the most common are the hero's journey and the three act and then like little brackets five act structure. 
These are the ones that we see used the most. We see them used in all manner of media. We've seen them used multiple times through history. I personally don't prefer to use the hero's journey. I much prefer the three or five act structure, typically the five act structure, but use what works for you and what works for your game. So the Hero's Journey has a little bit more internal stuff and it also has a lot of external things in the form of guides, etc. Whereas the three or five act structure is a much more general breakdown of a story. One thing that is very important with creating narratives that have strong emotional impact is to be very cognizant of where you raise tension and how you raise tension. I do recommend using the three or five act structure as a very good overview of where you need to raise tension and how to get from point A to point B. So as you can see, you've got your beginning and you, you know, work up to a climax and then you have your bit of relaxation. I think that it is a really good structure because it helps you build tension throughout and it shows you how. And then it's important that you don't end at the climax. You want to give your players a little bit of breathing room as you come into the conclusion of a game. I think that's really important, otherwise players can play, 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 huge climax, and then all of a sudden that's it and it ends, and they don't feel like what they've done in the story has had a really big impact on the world because things have ended so abruptly. So that breathing room is really important. Things like epilogues, endings need to have just a little bit of it in order for a narrative to feel very emotionally satisfying and real and grounded for a player. So if you break down your narrative into one of these structures, it becomes easier to identify key beats, themes, and moments of tension. You can then play with this tension to further raise the stakes with your story. It also really helps to understand your structure as it makes it easier to kill your darlings. And it's important to know when to kill your darlings in order to have a stronger story. For anyone not aware, I will very quickly outline what kill your darlings means. This is a fairly popular literary term and basically it refers to creators cutting storylines, elements or scenes, potentially even characters that they have worked hard on or are attached to. It's not fun to kill your darlings, but it can be very, very important. A lot of writers and teams are hesitant to kill their darlings. Unfortunately, it's a very necessary part of writing. If you keep your darlings, sometimes there can be too much fluff then too much fluff slows down storytelling, which makes players bored, which makes players lose emotional investment in the world and your characters, which then leads to less emotional payoff. So the more that you can get rid of the bloat that a story has and make it lean and compact and quick, the better chance you have of retaining your player's interest as well as their emotional connection to your story itself. So we want to keep players interested, invested, and excited. And we do this by killing our darlings. Tight narratives with very little needless exposition help accomplish this. And I think it goes without saying that the more invested player is, the more emotional payoff they get from a story. And the more they hopefully enjoy a story or at least feel that it was satisfying to play the game. Now, I've discussed what a narrative framework is. I haven't shown you one yet, but we're getting there. Very quickly, I want to talk about why we should use narrative frameworks before I give you some concrete examples. Now, a lot of people I'm sure are thinking that this is easy and that they might know all of this because you've been studying writing for however long and it'll naturally come across in your writing. Now, I'm sure some of you are right, but I would say that this is wrong in most cases. And that's because games are very different to other forms of storytelling mediums, especially the more traditional ones. And I'm gonna be going into that a little bit more. Writing without clear frameworks and structure not only can lead to bloated, bogged down stories that lose player interests, but your stories really do run the risk, especially when you have branching narratives of getting very convoluted and not having the appropriate tension or emotional payoff or even character development that you want to see within the world. If you want to have the best amount of investment and maximum emotional impact on a player, you need to plan your narrative and tweak it accordingly over time, which frameworks help with. To have a clear vision for your narrative and a way to get there. See why I use them? This is why. Now we've already spoken a little bit about this, but let's have a quick look at some of the other benefits of using narrative frameworks from within your narrative team as well as your broader studio. Here we go. So, oh sorry, I'll get out of the way. 
On top of being a useful tool to improve writing, there are other benefits that are felt through a studio from employing narrative frameworks to produce strong documentation, because documentation is important. One of the best uses of a framework and something that's very useful is that they can create a roadmap with measurable deliverables. You can have your framework, write it all out, you'll really want to do it for your overarching story, do one framework, fill it out, and then you want to use that same framework and template and apply it to each of your chapters. This could be chapters, that's how I like to structure narrative, it could be major plot points, it could be narrative beats, whatever you want to do in terms of how you break down your story, employ that framework again. And the good thing about having the framework and having measurable deliverables means that you can take that framework, understand what you were trying to do in a chapter, and then contrast it with the writing that has been produced. And it can be very clear then whether you have managed to get where you were going and whether you have managed to achieve what you set out to achieve. So you've got, you can have measurable outcomes for your overall narrative as well as side quests, mini arcs, character development, changes in the world, etc. It makes it easy to align on vision in bigger teams when you have clear frameworks. It's a really useful tool for your studio and publisher as it gives a very good top-down overview of your story and then it means that your studio and publisher can review and sign off on your separate plot beats and elements before writing commences and they have a way to review your deliverables which is very useful now we've discussed what a narrative framework is we've discussed why you want to use them so what do they look like in video games as i briefly touched on earlier there is a big difference between video games and other more traditional forms of media and most of the information that you will find online when researching narrative structure as i mentioned earlier refers to those traditional forms of media and storytelling such as movies tv comic books literature even radio however games have a very different and unique set of affordances which means that our frameworks need to cover more bases and we need to be a lot broader and also more careful when we make these narrative frameworks. So how are games different? In quite a few ways. You've got a lot of storytelling through your setting, you've got sound design through interaction, player agency and the big one, branching narrative. So when I talk about storytelling through setting, I mean when a player moves around and can interact with things, we get a lot of information from the world through that player agency and we experience that setting through the character and each person that plays a game, each player, will experience something slightly different depending on their play style. So it's very important to have cohesive storytelling through your setting and sound design is very different in video games. I find this fascinating. It's very different in video games than other forms of media because yes, you get sound effects and you have a story built through sound in things like movies and TV, However, when you're playing a game, there are different cues that will make a sound happen and there are different ways for a player to experience the soundscape and all of that is also part of storytelling. Now, yes, play agency is a big part of it. It could be that you're walking around and interacting with things or choosing to interact with certain things over others. I think another really good example of play agency when it comes to storytelling is when you look at the more major RPGs, I think a good example would be Dragon Age, where you have an entire story that is told very, very well through just playing the game, but then as you explore the world, you get lore entries that are something you can opt in or out of and you can go and read later. And these lore entries really help build the world out further. I think that they're fascinating and they're a really good tool for players who want to learn more about the world in a very in-depth way, but they're put to the side so they don't bog down the main narrative. They're effectively like fat that's been trimmed and then condensed into bite-sized pieces that are very easily accessible for the people that want to access them. I think that is something really exciting that video games do. And then, of course, branching narrative makes a huge difference. Now, I know you could argue that choose your own adventure books are branching narrative, 
I know, but I would say and argue that it's not quite the same as video games due to all the other storytelling methods also mentioned above. And it's important to remember that with branching narrative, you have to be so much more careful with your frameworks and they have to be a lot more robust because when you have so many different things that can change within a story, it can be difficult to track where the player has true agency and where there are static plot points versus where plot points change. And frameworks really help with that. We go. So I want to show you a blank template. This is one that I made that is very rough. However, I do use this myself and this is actually what we used on Puzzle Quest 3 as well. I really quite like this because it's simple and effective and I'm sure that if you take it and iterate on it further you'll have something even better that is more useful for you, the story you're telling and your own studio. But I did want to offer this with a link up there in case anybody did want to use it. Now I've got in here characters, characters and retinue etc. That's all stuff that I needed on the title that I worked on. You've got your narrative arc, point A to B. This is a paragraph max on your overarching story. Now, when you use this template, I want you to use it once for your overall story. And I want you to put your overall huge story into this. Yes? So I'm gonna use the example of Lord of the Rings and I haven't watched it in a while, but I think it might be fun. I have got nothing in my speaker notes on this, so bear with me. But let's say you are putting Lord of the Rings into this and you're doing the overarching story. Your narrative arc point A to B would be something along the lines of Frodo inherits a magical gold ring. However, evil forces want the ring to rule the world. So Frodo leaves the Shire, his home, and travels with a band of followers to Mount Doom in order to destroy the ring. He destroys the ring and then must leave Middle Earth because he is changed forever. That would be your narrative arc point A to B. Probably still a little bit too wordy for your overall narrative arc, but you get the idea. And then your rough outline would be something along the lines of Bilbo Baggins plans a party, his nephew Frodo helps out, Bilbo Baggins reveals that he has the ring, Gandalf comes to town, party happens, shit goes down, etc. And that's how you would break down these very, very basic narrative beats. And then you've got your emotional beats, which are very important, obviously. They are the emotions that your characters are feeling and the emotions that go through and underlie the chapter. Then you have observable changes in world and characters. This is a really good tool because if there's no observable changes in the world or characters for your overarching narrative or for each individual chapter, this is probably more important for each individual chapter. But if there's no observable change in world and characters, in each chapter or plot point beat whatever structure you're using then you probably need to revisit why you're doing something in your story there should always be some even if they're minor observable changes in the world and or characters so it can be whatever you want then i think questions is a really useful tool to pop in here because it's a nice way for a writer to explore things that they might want answered or to work with the rest of the team and it's just a really nice little section to add. And of course, you've got additional notes and limitations. This is a really good place to include any other information that you might need to consider. This can include available audio cues, limit on scene lengths, or character limits if text boxes are static sizes, especially when you look at localization in some languages, the alphabets take up more space than others, etc., etc. There are any number of limitations that a writer needs to be aware of and listing them out simply helps keep them visible when writing. And it also highlights those specific limitations for other people to see when reviewing the writer's work. So for example, the one here is try to limit scenes to eight lines. Sometimes they might go over, but if they're going consistently over, it's a really good way for the person who's doing the editing or the read through to be like, oh, maybe we need to rework some of these parts because it's not quite fitting and it's not working to our limitations. Here is one that I prepared earlier. This is chapter six for Puzzle Quest. This is actually the framework that we used and I filled this one out. This was very early in the planning process and was the first chapter that was planned. It's not uncommon to flesh things out out of order 
It's also not uncommon to write out of order. So you want to flesh everything out and do all of your frameworks for each chapter and then it doesn't really matter what order you write it in because you've got a very clear outcome for each chapter to begin with. Like, yes, it's nice to write beginning to end, but if you can't do that for whatever reason, it's not absolutely necessary. So we decided to do chapter six in terms of framework and in terms of writing when all the framework for all the chapters was done first because we wanted to use it as an example for our publisher of what we were doing and what we were intending. And we did this because chapter six was early in our narrative, but also had our first true raising of the stakes. There are several emotional beats in this chapter, you can see them, and the world sees a lot of change by the end of the chapter as well. So as you can see, I filled in my narrative arc, they're trying to seek counsel with Empyrean the Red Dragon, they enter his lands, but they're attacked, and they see the effect Scorch is having on the land. Scorch is a bit of a, a wanker red dragon from earlier, causing trouble, destroying villages, you know, the standard dragon stuff. And anger is spreading through the land. When the heroes reach Scorch, they find out that he is blinded by rage and can't be reasoned with. In the ensuing fight, Scorch is killed and the heroes must reevaluate their way forward. I'm so sorry. Also, spoiler alert for chapter six of Puzzle Quest three. Just probably should have said that earlier, but that's all right. And then you have your rough, rough 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 outline here which just goes into a little bit more detail having your rough outline is really useful because you can just copy and paste it into your writing document or whatever way that you're doing your first draft and then i like to arrange my scenes and then flesh each one out based on the dot points it's a really nice simple way to understand how we get where we're going of course you've got your emotional beats here a lot of the emotional tension in this chapter is between Torrigan and Ori because he distrusts her after finding out that she's a dragon spoiler Ori's a dragon and then we see her have to come to terms with the fact that she has then slain one of her own kind and we see Torrigan's opinion change on her because of her actions and the things that happen within this chapter, which means that there are really easy to see changes in the world and the characters as a result of this chapter, which is exactly what you want. It also gives the player more of an understanding of things within the setting because we see how dragons and their emotions affect the environment and we get our first true raising of the stakes with real consequences. So not only do we see character development between Ori and Torrigan, we also get more information on the setting and we better understand the heroes and by extension the players place within the narrative, which is very useful. I've also got some little questions hanging out in there. You can see a little bit of planning between me and Steve. Steve is the CEO of our company and is just a bit of a mad lad. And we were talking to each other up there trying to figure some stuff out. And then I've got my additional notes, which as you can see are there. Now, this is the big one. Branching choices. This is where video game narrative design really does change from other forms of writing. So one thing I do really recommend doing, so you can see how different your choices are, is to write your story beat that contains your big branching choice, and then put do choice one and choice two, and do a narrative framework for each. Once you've done the narrative framework for each, compare them. If they're too similar, something has to change because at the end of the day, you want the impact of your choices to feel very real for the player. The more impactful and different the choice is, it doesn't have to be a huge difference, but there has to be a change in the emotional beats or the landscape of the player's character development or the world for a choice to feel truly narratively satisfying. So do your frameworks, compare them. If they're too similar, it may mean that you need to do some rewrites of just those parts or what you might need to do is rework the choice altogether because at the end of the day you don't want the outcomes to be too similar and this is a great way of seeing whether they're going to be too similar before you actually start writing in depth each of these choices so this is a really good tool when you're doing branching choices you can use it in dialogue but it is best for when you have major shifts in where your narrative is going to go when players can exercise player agency so yeah, as you can see, compare them, not enough difference, might be worth revisiting. Okay, so we've discussed what narrative frameworks are. We've discussed why we want to use them. I've shown you what they look like, but how do you use narrative frameworks for your game? Or my game, well, it's whatever game. So 
you've got some really, really easy dot points here. Conceptualize, plan, produce documentation for your overall story as well as each individual beat, chapter and choice. Write the things, kill your darlings. Between writing the things and killing your darlings, you do your first edit. Then once you've killed your darlings, do your final edits and then implement in game. Now everyone's going to implement in game differently, so have fun, do what you do, have a great time and follow this very simple dot point list. So what is documentation? In this case, narrative frameworks. Because documentation is not always narrative frameworks, but narrative frameworks are always documentation. And there you have it. That is how you want to be using it for your own games. And that's all she wrote, team. Here is the link once again to my blank template from earlier if you would like to use it. I would very much love to see where you take it, how you use it. I'm sure you can improve upon it. And in fact, I encourage it. I would absolutely love to see where you go with it and what you write with it. If you don't want to share what you write with it, that's totally cool. But if you use it, I would love to know. So, once more, you can find me at Ella Logren and gabriellelogren at gmail.com. This is a pre-recorded talk. So I will be hanging out, doing little typies. If there's a little Q&A section online, we'll be doing that now, pew pew now, yeah. Doing it now, I'm so sorry for myself. But if you have any other questions, you can find me at Ella Logren and Gabriella Logren at gmail.com. I'm happy to answer anything or provide any materials that were used in this talk. And I wish you the absolute best of luck with your writing. And I hope that you will use narrative frameworks moving forward and in the future. So thank you for having me. Fingers crossed I can be in New Zealand giving a talk in person next year. Let's hope. Thanks everyone. Bye.